So, I just completed Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and I'm like... Hello there guys, Blubbo10000 here, bringing you a new weekly video series, I guess. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time, and I'm gonna be talking about the games that I play in the comfort of my own company. I play a lot of video games, and I am constantly getting recommendations for games that I should try, games that I should pick up, and you know what? Now it's 2019, I've wanted to do these videos for a long time, I want to make a conscious effort to play as many games as I can, and one game per week? I think I can handle that. Just last month, I completed the entire Kingdom Hearts series to catch up for Kingdom Hearts 3, as well as Xenoblade Chronicles 2, which is the topic of today's video. And those are absolutely massive games to sink time into. So if I can beat a 40 plus hour game like Xenoblade Chronicles 2 in less than a week, I think I can do a game a week for you guys. I don't know what direction the show is going to go, I don't know if it's going to have a name, or what I'm going to be doing with it in the future, but for now, I just want to talk about the games that I enjoy with you guys. So yeah, each week we're going to complete a game here on the show, and I'm going to go through the main story campaign of the game that I cover, and I'm just going to discuss it here with you guys, and we're going to try this out for a few months, and see if it picks off. So if you enjoy this show, please make sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and tell your friends, because YouTube word of mouth is the best way for a channel to grow, and this is a really scary endeavor for me, so I'm just praying that it goes well. So, as I said earlier, on today's first episode, I am going to be tackling a major JRPG, Xenoblade Chronicles 2. So, without further ado, let us begin. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is the third game in the Xenoblade franchise, created by Monolith Software. It was released on December 1st, 2017, my birthday might I add, and it received critical praise from fans and reviewers alike. Now, I have tried to get into the Xenoblade franchise before with the first game, Xenoblade Chronicles for the Nintendo Wii, also on the new 3DS, but I just couldn't dedicate the time towards the game when I was younger. Chronicles 1 had a bit of a reputation as this absolutely humongous game that would eat up all your time, but would be totally worth it. However, I just found the game a bit too complicated for my tastes, and I ultimately stopped playing the game very early on. I never picked up Xenoblade X for the Wii U, but I eventually bought Xenoblade Chronicles 2 off of the eShop when I kept getting recommendations to play it. That was two months ago. I never actually bit the bullet until a few weeks ago, because I was dog-sitting at my sister's and her internet bill didn't get paid, so I lost all the internet there and we ended up having to move all of my electronics, like my computer, back to my place, so in order to stave off the boredom, I left my Switch at my sister's. I had to be at my sister's for most of the day dog sitting, so I figured it would be a perfect time to start Xenoblade 2 because I had so much free time to fill. I played the game in the afternoons, headed to my place to stream, then came back to my sister's and played more Xenoblade into the early hours of the morning, and on the 9th of January I finished the main campaign for the game. So was this game actually any good? Is it worth your time? Let's find out. So the story segment of this video is going to be very short because I do not want to spoil the story at all for those of you who may want to play this game. So the basic plot points you need to know are that you play as a young salvager called Rex, who lives in the land of Allrest, 
a world where all of the continents are made up of massive creatures known as Titans, which humanity has settled on. However, these Titans are slowly dying out, and living space is dangerously close to running out. When a Titan dies, it falls into the Cloud Sea, which makes up the rest of Allrest's world and acts as an ocean of sorts for the planet. It's also where salvagers dive in to collect various treasures which they can sell for cash. It's Rex's day job, basically. Long story short, after accepting a shady job from the chairman of Allrest's Maid Trading Guild, he comes into contact with our second main character, Pyra, a blade known as the Aegis, who makes a promise with Rex to find the lost land of Elysium, which is rumoured to be at the top of the World Tree, a large structure at the centre of Allrest, and each of them begin their journey for their own specific reasons. So Rex and Pyra begin the adventure of a lifetime to find Elysium, venturing across the different Titan Kingdoms, and learning more about each other and the world around them, meeting up with various different party members like Nia the Gormotti and Tora the Nopon, solving international conflicts and killing a lot of monsters along the way. And that's the bare bones of the story, without spoiling anything. This is a JRPG after all, the story is paramount, and there's a lot to experience. There's enough twists and turns to keep you engaged, and if you've ever played a long JRPG before, or if you've played Xenoblade 1, then this is nothing new to you. If you're concerned about the story, let me tell you, it is worth your time. So, the gameplay for Xenoblade Chronicles 2 can be boiled down to an open-world JRPG, where each Titan is its own area to explore, each with their own climates, settlements, monsters, and objectives to complete. For example, after completing the first chapter of the game, you'll be introduced to the lush green fields of Gormot, where wildlife is teeming and the people are flourishing. The general rule is that if you can see it, you can go to it, with each of the Titans being absolutely massive locations to explore. However, unlike the extreme scopes of previous Xenoblade games, Xenoblade's 2 level design is more focused on verticality, offering a more dense world as opposed to large open spaces. This makes sense, given the limited land of the Titans is one of the main plot points of the game, as space is running out for people of all rest. But not to worry. Despite the verticality of the world, you'll always know where to go thanks to a handy-dandy compass bar at the top of the screen that keeps track of your objectives, be it a main story quest or a side quest. Main story quests are marked with a red marker, while side quests are marked with blue markers. A blue question mark means there's a side quest you haven't started yet, while a blue exclamation mark means an objective for whatever side quest you have active. You can only have one side quest active at a time, be wary. Simply do a 360 degree spin until the marker you're following lines up with the center of the compass and follow that direction. The number underneath the marker tells you how far away your destination is, and often you'll see an arrow either pointing up or down by each marker. If the arrow is pointing up, your objective is on a higher part of the environment, and if the arrow is pointing down, your objective is on a lower part of the environment. The arrow will vanish once you're on the same level as your objective, however. You can also press X at any time to bring up your skip travel page, which allows you to look at a map of the full area you are in and warp to waypoints marked by small squiggles on the map. You can also press down the right stick to scroll through mini-map sizes and even minimize the map entirely if you want to navigate on your own. Across the environment, you'll find areas known as collection points, which, if you click on them, will offer you various items based on the area you're in. Some will give you various types of wood, some will give you fish, some minerals, some plants, etc. There's a lot of collection points, and whenever you see one, you should always hit them up as some materials are vital to side quests and main story quests, which you can only obtain through these collection points. Now, let's get into the meat of the game, the battle system. Though, firstly, we'll need to tackle what you battle with before the actual mechanics. 
You will do battle with a variety of monsters and foes on your journey through Allrest, and as I mentioned earlier, your companion Pyra is a blade, which is essentially a living weapon. Blades come in all shapes, sizes, and elements, but one thing is the same across all blades. They must have someone known as a driver to help them in battle. Rex and your eventual party members you acquire are known as drivers, people who can wield the power of equipped blades. Each blade comes with their own weapon that their driver uses in battle. For example, Pyra's weapon is a traditional sword, and you can get other weapons like ether cannons, axes, shields, and my personal favourite, the dual scythes. While the game will start you out with just Pyra, after a certain point in the story you'll be able to awaken new blades using core crystals, which you can then equip onto the character who awakened them, and use these new blades in battle. You can have up to three blades equipped at a time, though you have to progress far enough in the game to unlock the third slot. You can also quick switch between these blades in battle, but beware that upon switching a blade, there is a cooldown period before you can switch back to the blade you were previously using. There are over 30 rare blades which you can awaken, each with their own elements, arts, and weapons, so mix and match and find what works best for your playstyle. But be aware that Awakening Blades is extremely luck-based, as there's a random chance that you'll actually gain a new rare blade versus a generic common blade. You can use boosters or rare core crystals to increase your chances of finding rare blades, but my best luck came from just using common core crystals with no boosters. The rate of discovery for rare blades just isn't that balanced, and feels skewed in a way that makes the whole point of boosters and core crystals a little bit useless, and some rare blades can only be obtained through side quests as well, so yeah, there's a lot of different options here. Now, while obtaining a blade is all well and fine, your blades aren't going to grow stronger unless you put in the time to work with them. Each blade comes with their own affinity chart, which details all their various power-ups, as well as the requirements for obtaining each of these power-ups. There are five rows of these perks, however, only the first row will be unlocked upon awakening or obtaining your blade you must complete certain requirements to unlock each subsequent row, with the most popular being boosting your trust stat with your blade. You can do this by using your blade in battle, or by completing heart-to-heart -heart conversations that involve said blade, though this more applies to rare blades and non-story important blades. Be aware, however, that there are some rare blades who do not grow with trust, for example, Zenobia, a rare blade you can awaken through the Awakening system, only levels up as you defeat unique enemies in each region, while Ursula, for example, has her own dedicated side quest that needs to be completed to unlock her rose. Other requirements to unlock each new power for a blade can be found by hovering over each specific icon, though, so you're never left in the dark about how to progress each chart. Though, Loki, nobody is going to judge you for googling when it comes to using pouch items to unlock abilities. That's a lot to go through, and those items can cost money, man, but we'll save that for later. However, I do want to warn you right now, with the affinity charts for each blade, you will often get messages in battle stating a character has fulfilled the requirements to unlock their new abilities. What the game doesn't tell you is that in order for these abilities to actually be active, you need to go into your menu and go to that blade's affinity chart, which will trigger a small animation that unlocks the perks. I made a habit of checking my affinity charts for each blade periodically, to ensure I wasn't missing out on any new skills, and it's made easier to navigate through as a simple click of the ZR button will take you through each blade equipped to your party. So to reiterate, if you don't check your blade's affinity chart after completing the requirements for an unlock, you will not receive the unlocked ability. Okay? Got it? I am saving you a lot of hassle here. Moving on. So, using blades in battle starts off pretty simple, but gets more complex as the game introduces more mechanics. 
It can be very confusing once all the mechanics are available, so I'm going to try and explain the battle system in a way that allows you to get the most out of it if you choose to play this game. There's gonna be a lot of detail here. Oh god, I have to edit this. Firstly, the game is balanced around parties of three, so try to hold off on major explorations or fights until you've got all three of your starting party members. It's always useful to have an attacker, a healer, and a tank on your party at all times. Rex is an attacker, a damage dealer who specializes in bringing the pain as best he can. Nia is your healer. She has abilities that can restore health and is the most fragile member of the party, but you need to get used to using her because she's the only healer you'll get in your party from start to finish. While Tora is a tank. He is able to take damage, draw aggro away from the other members of the party, which is vital when taking on powerful foes or groups of enemies that could easily swarm and take out Rex or Nia. Blades each come with their own class as well. There can be attacker blades, healer blades, or tank blades, and it's often a good idea to ensure that Rex, Nia, and Tora, as well as future party members, have blades that help their own classes. While you can mix and match and attempt to make Rex a healer if you really want to, I found that in my playthrough, sticking with the character's base classes was the best way to go, and I had no difficulty issues whatsoever. Plus, if you're planning on replaying the game, that's more of the time where you want to kind of experiment. For your first playthrough, try and be as smooth as you can. Now, battle itself, as mentioned before, can be quite confusing. A battle is triggered if you stray too close to an enemy, or you choose to draw your weapon and attack an enemy by targeting them with the Z button. It's worth noting that if an enemy spots you, you don't have to fight. Running is a valid option and often will save you a lot of trouble, especially if you die. Then any enemies you killed already will just respawn, which can just be a hassle at times. Your base attack is a three-swing auto-attack combo. To use this attack, simply approach the enemy you're fighting with your weapon drawn and stand still. This will initiate your auto-attacks. Every time you land a hit with your attack, your special moves, known as arts, which you can find in the bottom right corner, will begin to power up, shown by a purple bar that makes a diamond shape around the chosen art. Your arts are special abilities which can be used once their gauges are full, and each have different properties and abilities. For example, Rex's Anchor Shot can spawn HP potions, his Sword Bash is stronger when attacking the back of an enemy, while his Double Spinning Edge is stronger when attacking the side of an enemy. On top of this, if you select an art at the moment you're about to land an auto attack, you will get a boost in power for that art, as opposed to just selecting the art when Rex isn't swinging his sword. Now, beyond arts, you also have the ability to let loose elemental stage attacks based on the element of your blade. There are eight elements in the game, fire, water, wind, earth, light, dark, ice, and electric. And I recommend making sure you cover as many elements as you can within your party, because and this is where things get complicated. After using enough arts, the eastern diamond on your arts wheel will show the Roman numeral for the number one, signifying you can use a stage one attack. You can charge this attack up to a maximum of stage three, with stage four being a special case where it can only be acquired once you have reached a maximum affinity with your blade in battle. This affinity is signaled by the line of light that attaches a driver to their blade. It starts out blue, and the more you hit the enemy, use successful arts, etc., it will glow golden. Once it glows golden, just stand next to your blade and the meter will charge to stage 4, allowing you to attack with a super powerful move. Now, these attacks do have quick time events tied to them, with different blades having different QTEs, which you must do successfully to get the most damage out of your attacks. There are two types of QTEs, the first being a large circle, which is split into two segments, a lighter blue outer segment and a darker blue inner segment, where your aim is to click the button shown on the screen as a ring of light moves towards the center of the circle. In battles, you want to hit the button when it's on the lighter blue outer segment, not the darker blue inner segment. 
The game never tells you this, so I'm telling you now. The other form of QTE is a simple button mash, where you spam the button shown until it does the thing. Once you use a stage 1 ability, you'll notice a chart appear in the top right corner, which shows a small tree of different elements. The biggest diamond in the very center represents the ability you just pulled off. So, for example, you use Pyrus stage 1 combo, that big diamond would be a fire element icon. Above and below this first icon, you'll see two more diamonds with different elements. For fire, you'd see a fire icon on the top and a water icon on the bottom. These represent stage 2 abilities, and if you trigger a stage 2 ability that uses one of those elements within a certain period of time, shown by a bar that will appear above an enemy's health bar upon usage of a stage 1 attack, you will be able to perform a combo which is a more powerful version of a stage 2 attack. So let's assume Rex just used a stage 1 attack. You'd now know that you'd need to charge either a water elemental attack or a fire elemental attack to stage 2 via your blade's element to continue the combo. Now, near your healer starts with a water elemental blade draw mark, so chances are you'd get her to stage 2 before your character and Pyra got back to stage 2, as every time you use one of these powerful abilities, the bar resets. So, assuming you then use Nia's stage 2 water attack, you'd then have the option of either a stage 3 fire attack or a stage 3 ice attack to finish the combo. It works like a dialogue tree. Just keep an eye on your options and try to take combo paths where the elements are ones you can use. Fire Water Fire is a great first combo to try out. It's also worth noting that depending on the element used in your stage 3 attack, various effects can be doled out onto the enemy, which can shut down certain effects. This is especially useful against bosses, and I'll leave a link down below so you can figure out how to use the combo system effectively. Now, I've explained combos, arts, and auto attacks, but the most powerful ability in this game comes from a chain attack combo. In the top left of the screen, there is a set of three bars which will fill up as you fight. Now, these bars do have multiple uses, as if you or a party member is knocked out, you can use one of these bars to revive a character. However, if all three bars are filled completely, you can press the plus button to begin a chain attack combo. This is an attack where you and your party will be able to take turns attacking with your elemental attacks at an opponent. Now, you could just use it straight off the bat at the start of a battle, but you'll only get three attacks when the combo is over. To really use this chain combo effectively, you need to do a bit of work beforehand to set yourself up for massive damage, and understanding this feature could make bosses, unique enemies, and tough to beat monsters a walk in the park. Every time you finish a normal elemental combo, the element with which you used for stage 3 will appear above the enemy as an orb. So, for example, you use a fire-water-fire combo, a fire orb would appear above the enemy. When you use a chain attack combo, that orb will appear on the HUD by the enemy's health bar, and your goal is to break that orb by using your elemental attacks during the combo. If you break the orb after your third attack, you'll get another round of three attacks which you can do on your opponent. On top of this, you'll also get a QTE that allows you to power up your attacks from stage 1 to stage 2 right after the third attack is finished. Make sure to be on your toes because this is easily missable. And enemies can have as many orbs above them as you can send, keeping in mind that you can't double dip. If an enemy has a fire orb on it, you can't place a second fire orb on it as well. You have to break the first fire orb before you can place another. However, other elements are completely okay. So, the more orbs on your element, the more chances you'll have at breaking those orbs and getting even more hits onto your opponent. There's also an overtime mechanic for if you destroy three orbs in one chain attack combo, allowing you to do the most damage possible within this game. However, be aware that each element is weak to another element, and you can use that to break orbs quicker. These weaknesses are in pairs and go both ways. So, fire and water are weak to each other. Wind and ice are weak to each other. 
Thunder and Earth are weak to each other, and Light and Dark are weak to each other. Keep this in mind to maximize your damage, links below for a brilliant chart that can help you keep track of this information as well as combos. Okay, so I've gone over all your major attacks, but I want to quickly discuss enemies as well, as I kind of glossed over them. So, enemies will attack you if you get close, though if you are a way higher level than an enemy, chances are they won't aggro on you because they don't want to die. Enemies have a standard health bar, which you must deplete to win a fight. On some enemies' health bars, you may notice an element with an arrow pointing down. Not all enemies have this icon, but when you see it, use that element to deal damage to your opponent. That icon means that it is your opponent's weakness and you should use it, not that that is the element that your opponent is strong to like Chugga Conroy thought. Oh, that poor, poor guy. Later in the game, many enemies become enraged at half health, and some enemies will swap their element, while others who didn't have any element at the start of the battle will gain an element. Use this to your advantage and you'll come out on top. Lastly, across the world there are unique enemies, which, if you kill them, will stay permanently dead, though a tombstone will appear where you fought them so you can refight them at your leisure. These guys are a nice challenge and often give good drops and EXP as long as you're a similar level to them. So if you want to fight them, give it a go, but be aware that they are tougher than average enemies, and I would recommend a full three-person party before you fight any of them. Now, last thing about battle is death. When you die, be it in a normal fight or a boss battle, you'll be respawned at the last waypoint that you passed, which will be marked on your map by a little squiggle. Unlike other games though, Xenoblade is very kind when you die. If you die, you respawn, you don't lose anything, you keep any EXP you earned, and for bosses, you'll often just be respawned right outside their arena and given time to prepare for another go at them. You don't lose any progress. This means you can just keep throwing yourself at enemies and bosses without any fear of having to restart. And it's something I wish more RPGs would pick up on. It made my life way easier playing through this game and was a welcome addition. Overall, this battle system is very intuitive and once you understand all the little nuances you get on the mechanics, pulling off these major attacks is so satisfying. By the end of the game, I was able to use a chain attack combo of over 2 million damage. Now that's a lot of damage! Admittedly, I didn't realize some of this info like chain combo attacks until the end of the game, so don't feel bad if you don't get it or need to play the game to process the info. For the most part, you can get through the majority of this game without even touching a chain combo, but you should at least try to understand elemental weaknesses and the stage 1 to stage 3 combo system for maximum efficiency in battle. So, there are a few smaller things I wanted to talk about regarding extra systems in the game that you'll eventually come across if you play, which I think are quite important. Firstly, there's salvaging. At various points in the game, you'll find salvage areas, where as long as you have a cylinder in your inventory, you can get Rex to salvage and look for treasure and other fun stuff. To salvage, you do the same QTEs from a battle, only with salvaging, you need to hit the darker inner circle, not the lighter outer circle. The game never explains this, ever, so take it from me. When in battle, outer circle. When salvaging, inner circle. I've just made your life ten times easier. You will also have a variety of shops and upgrades you can add to your blades. Always invest in new weapon chips for your blades to increase their attack power and other stats. You can also mess around with auxiliary cores which give your blades small buffs, but I admittedly never really used them in my playthrough and I got through just fine. Aside from blade upgrades, you can buy many different items at shops which have a variety of effects. However, these effects can only be activated if you put an item into a character's pouch. Each party member has their own pouch and there are a variety of items to place in there, which can give benefits to your party for a limited time. Drivers and blades also have their own favourite items, so try to mix and match and figure out what each person likes, 
or, or just Google it, there's, there's really no shame in doing that either when some of these favorite items are needed for the affinity chart. Lastly, side quests and mercenary missions. I mentioned side quests briefly earlier on when discussing the compass feature, but this game treats side quests a bit differently to other titles. You can accept as many side quests as you want, and you can complete them in your own time, but once a side quest is complete, you'll notice the experience gained from that quest doesn't go into your main experience pool. That's because for main story quests and side quests that reward you with experience upon completion, that experience earned goes into your bonus experience stat. To use your bonus experience to level up, you need to sleep at an inn where you'll get a screen that lets you level up your party to however high they can go. Keep in mind that upon receiving new party members, you should always head to an inn to see if you can level them up. Mercenary missions also give you bonus experience, but unlike side quests, you don't perform these missions. After a certain point in the game, you can send blades from your party to complete these missions, assuming they meet the base requirements for each mission. Some may want female blades only, for example, and I'd recommend you do these mercenary missions as you can level up the mercenary band, and it is tied to the growth of one very useful blade. Now then, I have discussed a lot about the gameplay of this game, and I feel like I've only scratched the surface. But honestly, I feel like if I say any more, it might take away from the experience, and some things need to be experienced blind, so I'm gonna leave the gameplay segment there, so I think maybe we should go and take a look at the presentation next. Now, with the gameplay out of the way, I do want to go over the presentation of this game quickly, as there are a few things of note that some of you will no doubt want to hear. Firstly, how does this game run in docked and handheld mode? I personally played Xenoblade 2 handheld for the majority of my time, and I don't think it hurts the game that much. There are a few loading issues sometimes where graphics take a moment to fully render in, but I never had frame drops or anything that could be considered unplayable. The HUD looks fine, the screen displays everything you need, handheld is viable, though if you want to appreciate some of the gorgeous locations in this game, Docked will allow you to do that as well. This game is very beautiful. The art style is more timeless than the original Xenoblade Chronicles, which looks very muddy in comparison to Xenoblade 2. If you're hoping that the visuals will hold up and stand the test of time, I'm pretty sure they will. There are a lot of complaints about how a lot of the characters feel a lot more quote-unquote weeby, but it's a Japanese game, what the hell did you expect? In my opinion, this game is graphically very strong, and the character models work so well in motion that I'm not going to complain about them being weeby at all. Now, the voice acting for this game is good about 90% of the time. There are a few moments in the game where the voice actors were trying to match the lip flaps of the Japanese dialogue, which often leads to moments where they'd have a few long pauses in the middle of sentences. For example, you might hear someone go, Wow, that's amazing! Pyra? It can be annoying at times, but when the voice actors aren't constrained by lip flaps, I'd argue they are some of the best voices I have heard in a long time in an English dub. And honestly, I would love to give full props to Nia's voice actress especially, as she has a lot of really good lines in the story, and it's so refreshing to hear a good Welsh accent in video games. Apologies if I butcher this name, but Katrin Mayhew, I think that's how you say it, you did brilliant, and full props go to your brilliant portrayal of Nia. Though really, the entire voice cast is pretty spectacular. I can't think of a traditionally weak voice per se, just a few moments where I think some characters were shaky, the most prominent being Rex, as he can't shout. Ugh, damn it! Yeah! This could be due to his in-game age and might have been a purposeful direction the actor decided to take, 
But even so, it doesn't excuse how awkward it sounds in the main game. It's kind of like a child is like making a lot of loud noise but doesn't really want to wake the parents or the neighbors. And I'm not sure how it comes across. Which is a bit of a shame because when Rex isn't fighting or screaming, he's got one of the best voices of the lot. His snarky, sassy, joking nature is brilliant and he sells the character well. I'd say this English dub holds up a lot better than some might suggest though, and the use of different British accents pleases me greatly. Xenoblade has always been good at bringing in different accents and cultures and it is just a treat for the ears. Speaking of a treat for the ears, this soundtrack, oh my god, I had heard that the Xenoblade 2 soundtrack was good, but I had no idea just how good this soundtrack was actually going to be. Counterattack, Tantal's Night theme, Kingdom of Araya's Day theme, More Ardain roaming the wastes, which has no right to be as good as it is, mind you. You will recall our names, Death March with Torna, Bringer of Chaos, War and Peace, where we used to be, Battle with two exclamation marks, Song of Giga Rosa, Still Move Forward, and some of the cutscene music as well. Oh, I'm pretty sure I just listed half the soundtrack, and honestly, the rest of it should be mentioned as well. This is a great OST and accompanies the game beautifully. It elevates the presentation of the story and the gameplay to a much higher pedestal, and for that, it gets my seal of approval. Now, before I get to my final score, here are a few small tidbits of information, tips, tricks, etc. to keep in mind if you decide to play this game. Check your affinity chart. No, seriously, do it. Make sure to sleep at inns often for that bonus experience. Sometimes you'll only have Rex in your party, or you may lose a party member or two. This isn't permanent, just do what the game says and you'll be back to normal in no time. Some core crystals cannot be awakened until a certain point in the story, so if you see a core crystal that's not selectable, just keep playing, you'll get there eventually. At a certain point in the game, you'll come across a boss that you cannot damage. To save you the hassle, look behind it, there's wires you need to cut instead. Try and train Rex's other blades instead of just Pyra. You need a balanced team after all. Tiger Tiger is fun, and if you want Poppy to be fun too, you'll play Tiger Tiger. Early in the game, there's a mechanic brought up about the levels of the Cloud Sea and how it blocks certain areas. Honestly, it never comes up after you leave Godemot, so don't worry about it. In special areas across the map, you'll find field commands. These require you to have leveled certain blade powers to specific points in order to progress. Try and raise Pyra's focus and Dromark's ancient wisdom if you can. You'll need them. Eventually, you'll reach a titan called Indol on the main story. Try and complete everything you need to do in Indol before the end of chapter 8, otherwise things might get a little bit tough for you. Remember that when doing mercenary missions, once you have enough points to upgrade your mercenary band, you must go back to the mercenary camp itself, you can't just upgrade it from the menu. Collection points. Look at them all, it doesn't matter if you don't want to, you will thank me later. Some dungeons will require you to kill specific enemies to progress, so pay attention to cutscenes and you'll know what to do. If you need a refresher on in-game mechanics, look for informants in each town, they sell tutorials for money. If you buy one of everything within a shop, the shop may offer you a deed which you can purchase to gain permanent buffs, including discounts, faster running speed, and more. Be aware that not all shops have all their inventory available from the first visit. You can upgrade your arts from the driver options menu, but you only get points for upgrading arts by actually using the weapons you want to upgrade in battle. The yellow bar under your character's life bar is the experience gauge. Experience is shared among all of your party, including those not participating in the fight. And lastly, we are Ursula's new groove! And we'll do what we can! So, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, I absolutely loved my time with this game. It was a brilliant, exciting spectacle, and it just felt easier for newcomers, and it felt a lot less daunting than Xenoblade Chronicles 1, which I felt was a bit harder to get to grips with. 
This game is a perfect entry into the series for newcomers, so if you've never played Xenoblade Chronicles 1 or Xenoblade Chronicles X and you want to get into the Xenoblade franchise, this is the game for you. Now, it also does have a range of DLC, including pretty much a 10-hour campaign, Torn of the Golden Country, which I haven't picked up yet, but we might be seeing it in a future episode, so keep an ear out. With all of this in mind, though, where does it rate? Well, I give Xenoblade Chronicles 2 a Platinum Star. This is a game that I was enthralled with from start to finish, and it treated my time well as a player. And the Platinum Star only goes to games that I feel are 100% worth finishing and enjoying. It is not something I'm going to be giving out lightly in the future, but Xenoblade Chronicles 2, it earned it, man. And if you're interested in a full look at the rating system, check the description as I will leave an explanation of all of my little ratings there for you to take a look at if you're interested. So with Xenoblade Chronicles 2 now over and done with, I think next week I'd like to take a look at a smaller game because Xenoblade 2 was absolutely massive and I'm a little on the exhausted side and indie games are perfect for that sort of thing, but what are we going to be playing next week? Hmm, maybe some Hyperlight Drifter? Hey there guys, if you're listening to this, that means you watch the entire video, which is amazing, or you skip to the end, which is disgusting. Thank you for watching this video nevertheless. I was so excited to get this video out there and showcase what this new series is going to be, what the ideas I have for it are, and I'm just, I'm really excited. I really want this video to do well, more than any of my others. Like, literally, like, this is the one video that I'm like, I put a lot of time into it. It's 40 minutes long, damn it. <laughs> I just want it to be good. I want people to like it. I want people to try Xenoblade 2 because of this video. That'd be really nice. I want to make it a goal to complete every, uh, a week. I am confused. I, I'm not even going to edit this out because this is the non-edited part. This is the bit at the end of the video where I just talk with you guys. But I wanted to make it my goal to complete a game each week this year. And I just thought the least I could do is share my experiences with you guys. One of the things I've always wanted to do ever since I started YouTube was like reviews. And I tried that last year. Didn't work out. Uh, the Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Mega Man 11 videos were fine. But I found that a review format necessarily wasn't the best fit for me, whereas this sort of more kind of comedic and uh, guide-like take, I think, kind of works better for me, and I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I just had a lot of fun, and I wanted these videos to be kind of both a review and a guide, hence why I went really in-depth into the battle system, and I talked a lot about the battle system, because god, that thing is confusing. I just really want to keep this momentum up. I picked a pretty crazy game for the first episode, but like, you're gonna go big or go home, you know? So I just hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe as usual. If you enjoyed this, please consider sharing this video with your friends, family, anyone who would be interested. Honestly, word of mouth is so much better uh, in terms of YouTube growth than just like, oh, I'm gonna like a video. If you share it with people, if you talk about a YouTuber to people, that's when people start to find that person out. And if you could just send this video to one or two people, I would be forever grateful. Uh, I want to give a massive shout out, by the way, to all of my patrons over on Patreon who are supporting me, because quite frankly, without them, without the financial support, it's not uh, enough to like kind of tide me over each month in terms of rent or whatever but without their extra support I probably wouldn't have the confidence to create this video and start this new series that I don't know if it's going to even do well but I'm really excited to try it as I said I just I just want this to do well <laughs> and I want to have some fun covering games that I maybe don't normally play so I hope you guys enjoyed thanks for watching I will see you guys next week for Hyperlight Drifter, or if you're a regular subscriber of my channel, I'll be seeing you in a day or two for Rate Their Chances, and I have Smash content going out every day anyway. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.